All right, well, we're going to turn to God's Word again. And uh, I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 22 through to 25. Maybe I'll start at verse 21. That'll connect us into Psalm 110. And, in, and inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he, that is Jesus, with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. <clears throat> and there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Let's pray together as we come to God's word. <clears throat> Lord, these words are living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we just come to you now to ask you to speak to us from your word, by your spirit, Lord, quicken the word, open our ears to hear, help the preacher to preach, and for everything, Lord, we depend entirely upon you. Just lead us now and bless us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're looking particularly to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 today. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. <clears throat> and uh, you'll notice I've entitled the message From the Guttermost to the Uttermost, and in a way following on from Easter. Guttermost is a term I picked Somewhere in my past, I don't remember where it came from, because it described the condition that I myself was in, personally, before the Lord saved me. I've often told people, people when the Lord saved me, I was in the gutter. It means to be absolutely rock bottom, without God, without hope, without any moral compass, and ready for the scrap heap. And you might not believe that, but that's where I was. To the uttermost, describe someone lifted out of these disastrous life situations into the forgiveness by God, a cleaned up life, faith, hope and love, and a glorious purpose for life in time and eternity. Uttermost means the greatest or the most extreme extent, the best possible outcome, the very best, the highest, the most wonderful. Verse 25 again says, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. I have a friend called Ross and uh, he grew up in Mafra in Gippsland, I grew up in Stratford. And I was living in Stratford at the time of my conversion, although I was converted in the city here. And uh, <clears throat> I was playing in the Stratford football team at the time. And I started to witness to my fellow players, fellow footballers. And uh, <clears throat> one day I heard the news that Ross Jones from Mafra had been converted too. That was about six months after me. So I started to tell the footballers, and some of them knew him. 
And Ross was a really wild character, I tell you. And they said to me, if Ross Jones is a Christian, it's possible for anybody. <laughs> From the guttermost to the uttermost. Ross, by the way, went to West Africa. He translated four Bibles for the people. For 50 years he was out there. So I'm going to answer three questions from this Bible text, verse 25. And the three questions are these. Who are the ones the Lord Jesus Christ saves to the uttermost? Secondly, why is he, the Lord Jesus Christ, able to save to the uttermost? And thirdly, what does it mean for us to experience salvation to the uttermost? This is where the rubber hits the road, as we say, how the gospel applies to us. <coughs> but firstly, who are the ones the Lord Jesus Christ saves to the uttermost? Well, that's an easy answer. <coughs> it's in the, in the text. Those who come to God through him. Simple as that. Those who come to God through him. So this is the most important question. Many people try to come to God. They use religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam. Christian religion is one way people try to come to God, by doing what we do, our own works and efforts and religiosity. But all in vain. <clears throat> There's no point in us inventing a way to come to God. And Christian religion, I think I've said this before, is actually one of the greatest enemies of the gospel. <clears throat> I often say to people in, in witness, especially on the street, I'm not a religious person. And I know I'm not a religious person. <clears throat> because Christianity, <clears throat> real Christianity, is relationship. It's a personal relationship between you and the Lord. And that's not religion. <clears throat> so, friends, I must ask you today, all of you, are you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as your only hope? Your only hope is to trust in him. Not in church, not in religion, but in him. I don't know how many times I've heard in what is now 60 years as a Christian believer, how many times I've heard, and even most recently, many times in the street, <laughs> that aren't there many ways to God? Surely there are many ways to God. And there's no thought or acknowledgement of the truth of this text. Only through him, only through Christ, can we come to God. But many people make this vain attempt. <clears throat> and at least that's a starting point, isn't it? Because they believe in God, at least. And Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, those who come to God must believe that he is. That's a starting point. You've got to believe that God is. <clears throat> and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. A Muslim who prays, at least he believes there's a God. And that's a starting point. <clears throat> He just prays in the wrong direction and through the wrong mediator. <clears throat> and that's why I just want to briefly mention the destructive forces that are in our society today, trying to cause people not to believe that God is, trying to force people to deny God. And I think the most Hearness, one of these, is the, the theory of evolution that's penetrated our schools and our universities and all our education institutions. Try and cause people to believe that God is not. That everything just came by random chance. As the little girl cried out in class on one occasion when she was being taught this evil thing, which it is, so first there was nothing, and then it exploded. That's, that's the theory. And it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Absolutely ridiculous. 
But it's one of the ways men try to stop us believing that God is. Because if we don't believe that God is, you can't come to him. You don't even want to come to him. You deny him. And sadly, this doctrine is creeping into our churches, even into our Presbyterian churches, to try and reconcile it with Genesis chapter 1. And it's just evil. Because what happens is, <clears throat> if you put evolution into Genesis chapter 1, which is a historical document, you have to believe in death before Adam because of the billions of years that are involved. If you believe in death before Adam, <clears throat> then the gospel is gone because the gospel says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And if you deny that death came through Adam, you're denying the need for the gospel. Death has been there always. And the other very, very sad thing is that you have God at the end of day six looking down on death over all these billions of years. And what does he say? He looked on his creation and he called it very good. How can death be very good? How can God possibly be forced to say that? And that's what happens. That's the truth of it. That's why it's so serious in our modern day in relation to the Christian message. <coughs> we have to stand up and be counted. So, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for us. Have you come to God through Jesus? That's the question this morning. Have you come to him through Jesus? There's no other way to come. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he was raised from the dead. To give us forgiveness, salvation, life, eternal. But it requires, to come to him in this way, it requires total surrender. Total surrender of everything you have and everything you are. Because he purchased you, didn't he? On that cross, he purchased you. He paid a ransom price to set you free. And you became his. If you're his, you've no longer got any right to your own life. To make your own decisions, to go where you please and to do what you want to do. You're entirely his. That has to be. There's no other way but total surrender. That's the beginning and the end of it all. Here's another wonderful story of a person who was saved from the guttermost to the uttermost. When I was at Bible college, <coughs> I had to earn money to pay my fees. <coughs> and uh, I got a job with a lady just up the road from the college, Miss Nell Pivas, weeding her garden. And she used to pay me something for weeding her garden. And one day she came out of her house and she said, Len, she said, the most amazing thing has just happened. And I said, oh, really? And she said, yes. There was a lady just up the road here that my Bible study was praying for. And we were witnessing to her and trying to get her to come to the Lord. She kept refusing and refusing. This had gone on for years. And, and she said, and then this lady had to go into a hospital, into a hospital for an operation. It was a very serious operation, she said, and none of us expected her to come out of it. We thought that would be the end of her. <clears throat> we tried to, last minute, tried to convince her, but no go. And then she went under this operation, and she did survive. And when she came out of the anaesthetic, and people visited her, she said, I now believe in Jesus. While I was under the anaesthetic, he came to me, he spoke to me, he drew me to himself, and I was saved. And he, she said, this all happened while I was in the operation. Really, really wonderful thing happened. He is able to save to the very uttermost. 
But the second big question that arises from this text is why is the Lord Jesus able to save to the uttermost? And the following verses tell us why. He is able to save because he's become surety of a better covenant. He's able to save because he's not prevented by death from being the high priest. He's able to save, verse 24, because he continues forever. There's no end to his ministry. He's able to save to the uttermost because he ever lives to make intercession. He's able to save because as high priest, he's holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners. And he's become higher than the heavens. He's entered into another world. He's gone into another world way beyond where we are now. <clears throat> and there he sits on the throne of God, ever living to make intercession. And he doesn't have to make daily sacrifices like the Old Testament priests. He doesn't have to because he made a once and for all, all-sufficient, complete sacrifice for our sins. He doesn't need to make sacrifices daily. And then we're told he's been appointed the son who's been perfected in his work forever. A wonderful, wonderful salvation. Able to save to the uttermost. Finally, because of his resurrection, which proves to us that the death was sufficient. If he hadn't ro ris risen from the dead, we'd wonder. But because God raised him from the dead, he put the seal on him. This is the seal. This is sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world if the, if the whole world would believe. He's able. And the final question, what does it mean for us to experience the salvation to the uttermost? We've related to the questions, who are the ones who the Lord Jesus saves to the uttermost? Why is the Lord Jesus able to save to the uttermost? <clears throat> and now what does it mean to experience this salvation? You saw it in the life of the Apostle Paul, that amazing salvation he experienced. Racing around the Near East, persecuting Christians unto death, he said involved in the death of Christians because he was so angry with them. And yet the Lord turned him round. He turned him round. No one is too low. No one is too desperate. No one is too sick. No one is too despairing to be saved. The Lord reaches down to the guttermost level of desperation to despair in people's lives in order to save. No situation is too difficult. No distance from God is too far. No sin too great. No resistance too strong. Because while we were helpless, while we were sinners, even while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. He saves to the uttermost. Because while there is life in our bodies, he is able to save. You remember last week Chris mentioned the thief on the cross. One of them at the very last minute was saved. The other one was lost, presumably. But he was saved. Saved to the uttermost. I was travelling on a train from Warrnambool back in the 90s having preached in Warrnambool and an old lady sat beside me in the train and I thought to myself this old lady is very very near to her departure so I must talk to her about the Lord so I talked to her and turned the conversation and eventually was able to share the gospel with her and she said you're just like my great grandfather she said my great-grandfather was an evangelist too, she said. And she said, his name was Dr. John Singleton. And she said, I've got his diaries. And I'm working on his diaries now, she said. 
But the most wonderful part, she said in, in his diaries, is the occasion when, or the occasions when, in the last two weeks of Ned Kelly's life, he was visiting Ned in the Melbourne jail, bringing the gospel to him. And she said, it's written in my great-grandfather's diaries that he was fully persuaded that Ned came to the Lord before he was hung by the neck until he was dead. And in the diary it says, if the blood of Christ can avail for such a blood-stained character as Ned Kelly, where are the limits? There are no limits, are there? Even Ned, we trust, will see in heaven. And the first time I told that story in a church, I was watching and all the jaws of the people went like this. And I thought, you know, they don't understand the gospel. If I understood the gospel and the grace of God, they'd be saying hallelujah, but their jaws all dropped. As if to say, whoa, how's Glenn Kelly going to get into heaven? <laughs> He's able to save to the uttermost, friends. From the guttermost to the uttermost. And please, make sure you're trusting him. Make sure your life's been changed like it was changed for the Apostle Paul. None of us have had that experience. But we have had the experience of coming to know him. And we can say we know him. And we know that we're saved. Because we've experienced the washing away of all our sins. And the Lord is our Lord. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that these words are true. And Lord, we can trust them and receive them and believe them. And please, Lord, help every one of us here this morning if we're not already there, every one of us here this morning to come to you through Jesus to experience forgiveness, to experience new life, to hand over our lives to you, Lord. We know that's the requirement. We don't belong to ourselves. <clears throat> You've ransomed us with such a great price. And so, Lord, now we follow you. To you be the glory, to be, you be the praise and the honour. Forgive us, Lord, when we take honour to ourselves. All we have and all we are is yours. So take us, Lord, and may we today go on our way rejoicing. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.